We're in Jonah. Jonah chapter 3. Let's pray. Father, we love you, God. We are so grateful for tonight, so grateful for your word, so grateful, God, that you love us, so grateful, God, that your love knows no bounds, God, that you don't limit your love based on the way we look on the outside, based on the struggles that we have had on the inside. God, you have an all-encompassing love and I pray tonight that that love would capture and consume our hearts. I pray tonight that, God, you'd have our full attention, that, God, you'd meet us here in this place and, and that we would not only see the heart that you have for the lost, but, God, that we would bear that heart ourselves, that we would carry that heart into this world that so desperately needs the love of Jesus Christ. And, God, thank you for your holy word, how you've preserved it for us. We pray now that you'd speak to us through it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, you remember, we left our hero, right? This is where we left our hero, our hero Jonah. We left him on the beach. He was beachside covered with whale barf. And, you know, it was a pretty rugged scenario for our Bible hero, Jonah, because you know he had dug his heels in and he'd not been receptive to, to the will of God for his life. He'd, he'd not really submitted. You know, he had a very extended period of disobedience in his life, um, and yet he could not escape the grace and the love of God. Everywhere he turned, he found God. You know, let me just say, as I begin this message tonight, it is foolish to think you can run from God, all right? It's foolish to really think that sentence through, run from God. Really? Like, where are you going to go? Where can you go to escape Him? And not, not only can you go nowhere to escape Him, He loves you so much, and I mean this in a good sense, He will hunt you down, <laughs> He will hunt you down. You know, the old spiritual is called the Holy Spirit, the hound of heaven. He knows your scent, he's on your trail, and he is going to get you. That's how much God loves you. I think it's an amazing thing. But Jonah had been brought to this place where um, he had capitulated there in the belly of the whale, um, or the belly of the great fish, as it were. The, the word there in Hebrew can be used for either. We can't say definitively what it was. A lot of people make a big issue over that and strain in a gnat while swallowing a whale. But that was a joke. It's supposed to be camel. Are you guys, come on now. Be nice to me tonight. So he's in the belly of the great fish, and he comes to his senses. It takes three days Really think about this. He's dug his heels in. He's resistant to God. And it takes him three days to finally come to the place where he's willing to pray and seek God's face. And so he does. And as he does, now remember, God is omniscient. God knows all things. God knows it's going to take three days for Jonah to uh, confess and to repent and to turn his heart towards God. You know, what was the great fish doing while Jonah was in the whale? He was taking Jonah, who was headed to Tarshish, as far away as you could get um, from Nineveh as possible, and the great fish is headed back towards Nineveh, right? So while he's in process, God already knows what's going to happen. And the moment, Jonah has no idea. Jonah has no idea how this is going to roll out. He doesn't know how God is going to respond uh, but the moment that he makes this confession to the heavens, God hears and God speaks to the great fish, and it was prophet projectile vomiting from the great fish as Jonah flew up onto the beach. This is the first example of Bible extreme sports uh, that we see in the scripture. I'm not sure we want to try that, but this is, this is how the story um, picks up here in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose, and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent, and Jonah began to enter the city. 
on the first day's walk, then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So let me draw your attention to verse 1 where the Bible says this, that the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. I love that phrase. I'm thankful for that phrase. You know, it's not that God said, too bad, buddy, you had your chance. Could you imagine if God did that to us every time we failed, every time we dug our heels in? That with God, could you imagine if it was only one chance, and if you blew it on that first chance, you were out? Uh, this would be an empty chapel tonight. There wouldn't even be anybody preaching. But God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. You know, he's so willing. Aren't you thankful for the many chances that God gives us? So, yeah, somebody is really excited about that. I am too. You can give God gratitude and thanks tonight. That's like I'm inciting you to clap right now. That's what that was. <laughs> Help me. And so... You know, essentially, God says this as he's saying this uh, second time. He says, let's try this one more time, all right? Let's try this one more time. You know, the Bible is full of people where God said to them, let's try this one more time, beginning with Adam, beginning with Adam. Sometimes we don't start with Adam, but I think it's important for us to remember that God could have wiped it all out, wiped Adam and Eve out, and started all over again. But what we see in the Bible um, through great Bible figures, Adam and Moses, we talked about David this morning, I think about Joshua, we look into the New Testament, we see a person like Peter who struggled greatly, no one is exempt from struggling. And you know, I'm thankful for the honesty of the Bible, the honesty of the scripture where these people are presented in their reality, not perfect people, um, not people that never failed, but people that struggled, people just like you and people just like me. And the Bible does this, I believe, to encourage us, number one, to encourage us, because sometimes we need to be reminded that our God is a gracious God and that there's always hope with Him. And just when the, the devil would seek to get us down with his foot on our throat, compelling us to capitulate to him. What do we do? Number two, we remember who our God is and how he has worked with humanity uh, throughout the centuries before us. And so Jonah, of course, is uh, instructed by God. God says, we're going to try this one more time. Take two, arise, go to Nineveh, um, that great city. Preach to it the message. Note this. Preach to it the message that I tell you. So what happens? Does Jonah head to Tarshish? Does Jonah get back in the water and swim? Does Jonah hail down the next great fish? No, he doesn't do any of that. You've got to uh, give it to the guy here at this point in time. He was submitted, all right? He submitted to the will of God. Let me just make a distinction here. He was submitted, but he was not surrendered. There's a difference between those two things. He was submitted, but he was not surrendered. Um, by that, I mean this. He was willing to say, I'm going to do what he wants. This is what Jonah was saying. I'm going to do what God wants, but I don't want what God wants, nor do I like what God wants. Submission is a good thing. To be submitted, of course, is biblical. It's what God wants us to do. But sometimes in our life, there's a difference between being submitted to God's will and being surrendered to God's will. You know, it's, it's like that young girl. Uh, she was, as her dad was driving, she was standing in the passenger, she, passenger seat. And she's standing up, and her dad, as he's driving, he says, sit down. And she says, I'm not going to sit down. He says, sit down. She says, I'm not going to sit down. He says, sit down and put your seatbelt on. She sits down, she puts her seatbelt on, and she sits there with her, her fists clenched. And he looks over at her, and she says this. She says, I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. <laughs> Sometimes that's the way we are with God. Sometimes there's a submission in our life, but we've really not reached the place of being surrendered which means that not only do we want the will of God, but we've learned to love and to like God's will. Jonah comes into this great city. It is a great city. We talked a little bit about the dimensions of the city. It was overwhelmingly wealthy. It was a massive city. 
many gates, many towers, parapets, a very thick wall. It was an impenetrable city. Um, look at if you were living in ancient days, there were a couple of cities that would really strike fear into your heart. The city of Nineveh was one of them. It was so vast, the population was over 120,000 people, but it was so vast, it would literally take you three days uh, to get across it, three days walking. And God says to, to Jonah, I just want you to preach the message that I give you. Now, as Jonah begins, right when he gets into the city, this is what he says. He preaches this message, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Uh, there was a point in time where I kind of criticized Jonah for this very short message. Um, but remember, he was preaching the message that God gave him to preach. I mean, that was it. That's what God told him to say. Eight words. Now, I want you to think about this. Um, physiologically, we do know scientifically that for Jonah to have been in the belly of a whale for three days, the gastric juices inside of that belly would have transformed what this guy looked like on the outside. And there's studies that have been done. Uh, there are some examples that I'm not going to necessarily give you tonight. But Jonah would have been, his, his skin, because of the gastric juices, he would have been bleached white. All of his hair would have been gone. Got an example for you that here tonight. All of his hair would have been gone, and his clothes would have been seriously tattered. So he would have looked like an albino with absolutely no hair, all right, walking through the city of Nineveh. Um, it's possible as well that these people had heard word about this man being in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights. Remember, one of the gods that was worshipped in Nineveh by the Assyrians was the god Dagon, which was the image of Dagon was half man, half fish. And so all of this, this is what I'm trying to say to you, all of this would have been very overwhelming for your average Ninevite as they're looking at this guy who is preaching this very solid and simple message. By the way, this is the shortest message ever preached that yielded the greatest results. And it was preached with no love. Okay, <laughs> can you imagine this? This is what Jonah's thinking. Not, not only is God going to overthrow you guys in 40 days, but I can't wait to see the fireworks. I can't wait to see it happen myself. There was no heart uh, that was in this. There was no love through which it was being communicated. And something wild happened here. Notice in verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. You may want to highlight that. Proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then, then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. He laid aside his robe. He covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. He caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? So Jonah makes his way through, and this is what happens. God does a work. God does an amazing work. Now, I've painted a picture for you concerning how violent and barbaric this city was, all right? I mean, this was the most barbaric group of people possibly that have ever lived on the face of the earth. I'm not going to reiterate to you what these people used to do, but they had perfected torture. It was so extreme that when towns, villages, and cities heard that the Ninevites were coming, oftentimes this is what they would do. They would all commit suicide, they would all commit suicide rather than falling into the hands of the Ninevites because it was that bad. So if you're thinking of a decadent culture, think of the most decadent culture on the face of planet Earth today, multiply that by 500 and you might, you might get to the Ninevites. Um, and, and so I'm saying to you, this is the single most unlikely scenario you could ever imagine. The repentance of these people um, really did mark one of the greatest miracles that God has ever done in a city or in a nation. 
Because these people were the most unlikely people to do this, to believe God. Would you notice what it says in verse 5? The people of Nineveh believed God. It's not that they believed Jonah, although they did believe Jonah, but because the message was from God, this was what they were doing as they responded to the message. They believed God. It doesn't say they believed in God, all right? Which by that I mean this, it's not that they just assented uh, or ascended to an intellectual acknowledgement of the existence of God or perhaps the possibility that there is a God. They believed God. That means this, they acknowledged that he existed and that this message was coming from him. And this is what happened. It went viral. I mean, what God was doing in this city literally went viral and all of the people uh, responded in repentance. Now, when the Bible uses words like fasting and sackcloth, um, what it means is this. This was an outward demonstration of the inward affliction. It was an outward way of demonstrating that there was real, true repentance and change happening within the heart of a person. And so it started with the people. Word came to the king. So this um, obviously barbaric, arrogant ruler heard the message that was preached by Jonah, saw what was happening among his people, and what does he do? He gets up from his throne, he lays aside his robe, he covers himself. There are things I wish we had video of in ancient biblical times, this is one of them. How wild would it have been to see the repentance of the city of Nineveh? He gets up, he covers himself with sackcloth, and he sits in ashes, okay? And then he proclaims to the city, this is, he kind of like uh, goes uber on this, he takes it to a total other level. He says, not only is every human being going to fast, but every animal isn't going to eat either. So it's a complete fasting across the board. Not only that, this is his proclamation, let everybody cry mightily to God. Let everybody cry mightily to God. So he says, we all need to be praying, we all need to be making our cry to God, asking him for mercy and for grace. And then he says this, and this is, I believe, the real mark of repentance. He challenges everybody in the city uh, to turn from their evil ways and to let go of the violence that is in their hands. So a very, very violent sit city, a city steeped in violence, known for violence. And the king says this, stop doing what is wrong and turn your heart to God and begin to do what's right. Now, this repentance was so significant, so real, that some 700 years later, Jesus himself mentions the repentance of the city of Nineveh when he was talking about how those people who repented will rise up in judgment against the people he was preaching to because of their unrepentance. So there was real, genuine repentance. This morning we talked about the pathway to real repentance, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 to 11. How do we know whether or not we've really repented? How do we know whether or not our, um, our sorrow is sorrow in a godly sense that leads to life? Well, there are seven things that you'll see in those verses, and you can check that out later on. This is how God responds, verse 10. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So God's response is this. God acknowledged. God, the, the very thing, listen now, the very thing that God wanted to accomplish was, was accomplished. God's word never returns void. God acknowledges, this is what it means when the Bible says God saw their works, it means this, that God saw that they had turned from their evil ways. God acknowledged it. God acknowledged that there was something real and genuine that was happening within their lives, the very reason that he sent Jonah in the first place, and he stayed his hand of justice. He stayed his hand of judgment. He relented, he turned the course because these people definitely deserved judgment, and instead he gave them mercy. Let me tell you something. This is always the heart of God. This is always the heart of God. The heart of God is always to extend mercy to those who don't deserve it. And this is the message that you and I bring uh, when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ to whoever we may be sharing it with. 
All of us deserve judgment. All of us have earned the punishment of God. All of us have earned eternal separation from Him. But the heart of God towards all of humanity, um, in a corporate sense and in an individual sense, was not judgment. The Bible says that God takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. The heart of God always is to see humanity reconciled to Himself. And so he did this in sending his son to the cross. And Jesus was crucified on that cross. He rose again on the third day so the heart of God could lead people to his mercy and to his grace. Now, I want you to notice the simplicity of this because I think it's profound. This is as simple as it is. Eight-word message preached. All right, very short message. I know some of you wish my messages were as short as Jonah's message. Eight word, the simplicity of this message, eight word message preached, what we're going to see in just a minute, over 120,000 people repent and are saved. God acknowledges. Could salvation be that simple? Is salvation that simple? No, I think sometimes we have the tendency to complicate things. Uh, but as we look at the scripture, it's very simple, and, and I don't necessarily mean easy believism in the sense where we just say with our lips without living in our lives. I mean, there was something real and genuine happening in their lives that was demonstrated by the change of life. It procured a change in life in these men and women. Um, so I'm not, I'm not just saying, I'm not talking about belief that's not really belief. When we talk about faith and trust and belief, we're talking about something that's more than just words. It is a change of heart. It becomes a lifestyle. We are committed to the Lord. We believe in Him. There's demonstration. There's fruit. As James says, faith without works is dead. There should be evidence of our faith as there was uh, with the people here in the city of Nineveh. But it is that simple. You know, when you share the message of the gospel, I get concerned sometimes that we think we have to be theologians and that we have to be apologists, and we've got to answer everyone's questions, and we've got to get deep into theology to really lead someone to Christ. You know, it can be as simple as an eight-word sentence that contains the gospel. It can be that simple. I was ministering to someone a number of years back. Um, I've shared this before, so if you've heard it, uh, just be patient with me. Uh, this granddad, uh, I was young at the time, okay? This probably wouldn't happen to me to, today. But this grandfather was like, man, I want to minister to my grandson. I want someone young to speak to him. I'm going to go take him to see Derek. And so he brought him in, and I'm sitting in my office with this guy, and, and we're talking about all sorts of different things. You know, he has got all kinds of crazy beliefs. He believes in aliens. He believes in evolution. He believes in uh, conspiracy theories. And so we're working through all of these things, right? I'm like, well, let me tell you about aliens. That's all messed up. And let me talk to you a little bit about evolution. Let me share with you a little bit about conspiracy theories. And as I'm sharing this stuff, God said to me, stop talking. Stop talking. Open up your Bible to the book of Romans and have him read chapter 1. And so I shut up, which is good to do when God tells you to shut up. I shut up. I gave him my Bible. I said, man, I want you just to read Romans chapter 1. He read Romans chapter 1, and I said to him, are you ready to put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ? He said, yes, I am. And he got born again right there. The simplicity. Listen, I want to encourage you this year. I want to encourage you with the simplicity of this. Don't ever doubt that, that you can simply share the most powerful message in the world and someone can get saved. It's not your brilliance. It's, surprise, surprise, okay? It's not your charisma, it's not your good looks. It is not your persuasive abilities. It's not the depth of your theology. It's none of those things. It's not the denomination or non-denomination denomination that you belong to. It is the gospel. The Bible says the gospel is the power of God into salvation for those who believe. So the power doesn't rest with you. It rests with God. Your responsibility is to share. Your responsibility is to put it out there and let God do the work. The Holy Spirit is capable of convicting someone of sin and leading them into the arms of the Savior. So I'm going to, I just want to say this tonight, all right, this was unprepared, so hopefully it's from God. 
I want to ask you a question tonight. Have you ever led somebody to Jesus Christ? Have you ever led somebody? Have you had the opportunity? Have you taken the opportunity? Have you had the privilege of sharing the gospel with somebody and, and then inviting them to receive the Lord and seeing that person saved? Now, this is something I believe that God wants to do in the life of every single believer. Every single person that calls themselves a child of God, God wants to do this in your life. God wants to do this in my life. And before you go disqualifying yourself, because I already know, I throw that out there, and there are a lot of you that you're not arguing out loud. You're arguing in your mind with me, okay? You're like, no, no, Pastor Derek, that's not me. God could never. Don't argue with me. Don't argue with God. God does want you to do this. In fact, the Bible in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, gives us the great commission that is for all of us, not just pastors, not just leaders, but for you. So I would say to you this year, this needs to be your prayer. Before you walk out these doors, this is what I want you praying. God, please give me the strength and the courage to share the gospel with someone and give me the privilege of seeing them put their trust and faith in you. Can you pray that before you walk out these doors? All right, there's like four people that are going to pray that. Come on now. Come on, you guys. Can all of you do that? I'm challenging all of us. Now, maybe you are thinking tonight you're brand new in the faith and you don't, you, you don't really believe that you can um, verbalize the gospel in so uh, few words or at all. I want you to talk with one of the leaders tonight. We want to equip you to do that because we want to see God do that work in your life. So you would think, all right, God just saves 120,000 plus people. What do you think Jonah would be doing? You guys, is everybody here tonight? Is it just, am I the only one here? What do you think, what would you expect Jonah to do after a great revival like this? Okay, verse one, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. Oh my gosh. For it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Now, Jonah doesn't answer this question. We're going to see in a minute. Um, he runs off and he goes and hides in a hole, hopefully waiting for the destruction of the city of Nineveh to come. But this is his heart. You know, he's got a heart problem, all right? He's got serious heart issues. He is not only displeased, that these people are repented, his displeasure becomes angry. The ancient word here is tikeo, from which, which we get our English word ticked off. No, I'm just kidding. That's, that's not true at all. But he's so upset. He's so upset at what God has done. And this is what's going on in his mind. I mean, this is so foreign of us to even think that someone would think like this. He says, I knew what you would do. I knew what you would do. That's why when you told me, when I was in my own country, notice that he did not want to leave his country. He had a nationalism. He had a pride for his country that had created a prejudice in his heart against other countries. He said, while I was in my own country, did I not know this? Did I not know that this was how you were going to roll this out? Because I knew that you're a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness. Let me say something right here. A lot of people say, you know, the God of the Old Testament is so different than the God of the New Testament. Really? Where are we reading from tonight? We're reading from the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. He has always been, okay? And this is one of the greatest examples. He has always been gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness. He has always been someone who relents from doing harm. And D Jonah begins to devolve into this depression. He's so consumed by this, he literally wants to die. Now, you might be thinking tonight, that's just an, an idiom. 
you know, that's just an idiot saying an idiom. Uh, you know, he doesn't really mean, Pastor, that he wants to die. Oh, no, yes, he does. Because he's already thrown himself over the boat, and that, for him, was clearly, um, I believe, you know, a willingness to die physically, whether you call that suicide or just wanting to end his own life, whatever, he was literally there. And so when he says this to God, when he reacts like this, he's not just speaking empty words. This is really where this man is at. He is so upset that God has saved people that he has hated that he wants to die. What a horrible place to be. And God says to him, right, isn't that horrible? God says, is it right? Is it right? This is the question. Is it right? This is the issue for Jonah. Is it right? Now, let me say something to us tonight. We will never get it right. We will never get it right until we go to the Word of God and determine what is right based on what we read from here, okay? Jonah's perspective was not based on the Scripture. Jonah's perspective was based probably on, a, on the current attitude toward Ninevites, uh, during Jonah's time, and so his perspective of right had been twisted because he was marinating in this judgmental, critical attitude that the Israelites had towards the Ninevites. And I want to say to you tonight that before we judge Jonah for that, we are prone to do the same thing. We will never have the right attitude towards people. We will never see people the way that God wants us to see them until we go to the Word of God and we see how God sees people himself and then we adjust ourselves to his ways. Jonah's attitude was based on prejudice. It was based on religious superiority. It was based on judgmentalism. And it was based, listen to me, it was based on unrestrained hatred, okay? It was based on unrestrained hatred. You might sit here tonight and you might say, oh, I'm not religiously superior. I'm not a person who's given to prejudice. Um, are you a person that's judgmental? Do you make categories and put people in these categories and then treat them differently based upon how you feel it's right to do so? Is there an attitude in your heart towards somebody? Look at when I say you, I mean me too. But is there an attitude in your heart towards somebody that, that you are displeased with and your displeasure has, has grown exceedingly, so much so that it is festering into hatred? Before we sit back and judge Jonah for his attitude, I think that we need to acknowledge that sometimes we have a uh, very similar attitude. It may not be as extreme as Jonah's, but nevertheless, it is certainly not the heart of God, okay? It is certainly not the heart of God. This is the heart of God. The heart of God is grace and mercy for every single person, regardless of what they look like on the outside, regardless of what they have done in their life. God says through the prophet Ezekiel, I mentioned it already, God takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. Sometimes we get so caught up in culture wars. It's us against them and we built our walls and we're throwing a volley and they're throwing a volley and we can't believe what they've done to our country and we hate those. Hang on, hang on a minute. And look, I see this in the church. I see this in the national church. And we get so caught up in these culture wars and categorizing people that we lose the most important thing, and it's that person's soul. We forget that Jesus Christ loved that person so much, he hung on the cross for them. And we get caught up in our religious superiority. We get caught up in our judgmentalism. We get caught up because we hate what some group has done to our country. And while, yes, we can acknowledge and evaluate it as wrong, we need to distinguish. And we need to acknowledge that while it's wrong, God still loves that person. And God wants me. And God wants you to be the hands of mercy and grace and love to them. This is what I do oftentimes with respect to the church. Um, and I, when I say the church, I'm talking about in a general sense. I observe who it is. This is what I've learned to do over so many years as a Christian. I have learned to observe those people that the church is rejecting, that the church has categorized, that the church has kind of built themselves up against, and that the, the church has rejected. And 
I identify who those people are, and I can guarantee you 100% of the time, those are the very people that God is going to reach. Those are the very people that God is going to reach. He's going to raise up somebody who is willing to be a brand new wineskin. He's going to raise up somebody who has a heart that is his heart that bears and reflects his love and his grace. And he is going to use those people, that new thing he's doing, he's going to use those people to reach those who've been marginalized by religious, hypocritical Christians. All right? Now, that may sound like a heavy word tonight. But I say that to say this. I don't want to be the religious, hypocritical Christian. I don't want God to have to look at this church or to look at my life and say, you know what, Derek? I sure would love to use you but you've got such a stinking attitude that I can't. And so now what I'm going to have to do, because nothing can hold back my love, nothing can hold back my love, now what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to select somebody else to use because you have become an old wineskin. I do not want to be that person. And I know you don't want to be that person as well. And so before we judge Jonah, we need to just let the Lord search our heart. Because honestly, I'm not sure any of us would wake up in the morning with the intention of hating people, but you know it builds within our hearts and there's a, a veil of deception sometimes that blinds our own eyes, which is why we need God and we need his word and we need honest statements like the one I've just made and we need to be willing to say, God, you know what, I don't see that in my life, but search my heart. God, is that me? God, is that me? I don't want to have that same attitude that Jonah had, but God, maybe I do. Maybe I do, and I don't even see it. And you know, there may be people that God has been bringing into your life, knocking on the door of your heart. Hey, bro, hey, says, I love you. I just want to say, you may not see this, but I see a real, I see a real vein of legalism in your life. You know, you're really straining at the gnat and swallowing a camel, and while you've been being offended at that person, that person is a gift of God to you to reveal something that needs to be acknowledged and addressed. Let me tell you something. God does that in all of our lives. God does that in all of our lives. And the goal we need to have is to have a humble spirit to be willing to receive. And when that happens, watch out. Watch out world because you're a Christian that God is going to powerfully use. So he wasn't getting it. God had to do something in Jonah's life. Give him an illustration. Verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and he sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared, notice that phrase again, a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned, the next day God prepared a worm. <laughs> this is just so cool. God is so awesome. And it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's bald, I'm adding bald, bald head. If, you, if you've ever been in the sun and you're bald, you know how this can be overwhelming. So that he grew faint. Then he wished death for, this guy's got a serious death wish. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better, here he goes again, it is better for me to die than to live. So real quickly, Jonah heads over to the east side of the city, builds himself a little shade. It's not really working all that well. Desert, very hot. God prepares. God's prepared a storm. God has prepared a fish. Now God prepares a plant. This beautiful plant grows up, very lush plant, obviously, in a very short period of time. Total miracle. Jonah, his heart is grateful. This is the first time, by the way, uh, we're four chapters into this autobiographical story. This is the first time that Jonah is thankful for anything, okay? He's not known for his thankful heart. He's not even thankful that God saved him from the, the belly of the great fish. So he's thankful now, but God had prepared a worm that was eating the inside of that plant somehow so that in one day it withered away and Jonah goes from being thankful to having this uh, desert sun beating on his bald albino head, so much so that he grows faint. And here he now, look at, I mean, he is emotionally, this man is emotionally all 
over the charts, right? He is going from ex one extreme to the other, and he wishes death for himself again. Now, this, God was showing him something. God prepared this plant and then destroyed this plant to illustrate something to Jonah. This is what he says in verse 9. Then God said to Jonah, is it right, this is the question again, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, this is Jonah now answering God, it is right for me to be angry even to death. <laughs> you ever said that to God before? Have you ever like argued with God like that? Yes, some of you have. Look, most of, most of us have. You know, in the midst of the valley of great difficulty or challenge and you know, the Spirit of God is ministering to your heart, and God's calling you to do something you don't want to do, and you're arguing with God. You know, he's arguing with God here, and he's defending himself. It's never a good thing to defend yourself against God, because God is always right. And so verse 10, but the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? And the story, the story ends with a question. This is one of the craziest endings of any book in the Bible. But this is what God does here. God is teaching him a lesson. God is teaching him through the illustration of this plant, right, because this plant grows. Jonah has nothing to do with the development, with the growth of this plant. All he knows is he's enjoying it. The plant dies. Jonah's upset at its death, all right? Overwhelmed, so much so that Jonah wants to die because the plant has died. And so God says to him, <laughs> this is crazy, God says, really? Okay, that's what it means when it says, is, is it right, okay? That in Hebrew really means this, really? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Do you, do you not even see? You didn't labor. You didn't grow this plant. You didn't care for it. You didn't tend it. But at its death, you are so broken that you yourself want to die. And the, the illustration is this, that God had tended. God had grown. God had made. God had raised up. In a physical sense, these people of Nineveh that he loved so much, Jonah cared more about a plant than he did about people. Jonah cared more about plant, a plant than he did about people. Now, again, before we give Jonah a hard time, I want to dig in a little bit harder here for us, you know, and say, say this to us. You know, we can get, we can get upset we can become angry. We can uh, be set back when we have a financial setback or when we have stunted upward mobility or things don't go right in our workplace or there's challenges relationally or we've got difficulty with the kids or if we're financially challenged. We can get all angry and upset. And I would say this to you and to me tonight, do we show that same emotion over someone who doesn't know the Lord when they die and spend eternity in hell? Is there that sense of pain within our lives? This is what I'm saying. We can show grief over so many things in life, and yet when people around us who don't know Jesus Christ die, and according to the scripture, go to hell, we can, we can almost act as if it's not a big thing. Our hearts aren't even pricked. We're not even concerned. And probably we need to do a little soul searching on this. I, I know I need to myself. I think about this city, 40 million people come to visit here every single year. And we need to be more effectively reaching these people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are our hearts so compelled and concerned? This is what I'm saying. Are our hearts so compelled and concerned for our visitors, for our neighbors, for our family members, that we're grieved unless we bring them the message of the gospel? And this is what God is teaching the prophet Jonah. Now, the real issue here is this. The, the, the Bible book here ends with a question. Very random, I think, for 
This question not even to be answered. Uh, and it's interesting because Jonah doesn't even include any more about himself. We don't know if Jonah repented. We don't know if Jonah aligned himself with God. We don't know if Jonah ever made it back to Israel. We have no information. And I believe that the Bible divinely ends this book here because the real issue is not Jonah, all right? The, the real subject of this book is not Jonah. The real subject is God and his love. This is really the point, the reason why Jonah wrote this book. I think that we get sometimes caught up in, was it a great whale? Was it a great fish? What about the plant that God prepared? How about that little worm? I bet it was cute. You know, Jonah, certainly lots of things for us to learn in Jonah's um, disobedience, but then turning that into some sort of submission. But listen, as we end this book, the most important thing to learn is this, that we have a God who loves all of humanity. This is how great the love of God is. God takes the city that was the most ungodly. God takes the most, um, he takes the ugliest, in a sense, of society and humanity, and he reaches out to them with his love. This book is less about Jonah and more about the love of God. God is far more loving and far more compassionate than we think he is, okay? He's far more loving and he's far more compassionate than we think he is, and he is far more loving and far more compassionate than we are. We have got a lot to learn from our Heavenly Father. And I think that the saving of this city, let me, let me say this, there is no city that can't be saved. There is no country that is beyond the work of God's Holy Spirit, okay? Before you give up on the United States of America, before you say, hey, you know what, the city of Las Vegas is so far gone, it is over. Before you ever say that, I want to remind you of the ancient city of Nineveh, as absolutely barbaric as a city could possibly be. And what did God do? God did. In three days, three days of preaching, eight words in his message from a heart that wasn't even filled with love. The whole city got saved. And you know, God can do the same thing with the city of Las Vegas. Before we give up, do not give up on the people that God has divinely placed in your life for you to bring the gospel to. Do not give up on them. Do not quit. Do not say to them, hey, you know what? They are just so far gone, they'll never believe. Don't ever say that. Aren't you glad that someone didn't quit on you? Aren't you glad that someone persevered for you? Aren't you glad that someone put up with your nonsense and your craziness and dealt with it and still loved you with the love of Jesus? My poor roommate in, in college, secular college at UC Irvine, that poor guy, no, you guys have no idea. For nine months, for nine months, this, this poor Christian withstood beratings, uh, being made fun of for his faith, uh, drunken, drug-induced outbursts, violence, room torn apart to shreds. I'm telling you, you have no idea what I put this poor guy through. May God richly bless him in heaven. He never quit. He never quit on me. He never gave up. He never went to the RA and said, hey, you know what? I am living with a psychopath and I need out. I need out. He did say years later, after I'd been saved for a number of years, he did say, you know what? You were the last person I ever thought would get saved in our dorm. But let me tell you something. He never gave up on me. He never gave up on me, and I'm thankful for that. Don't give up on the people around you. Don't give up on them. Don't give up on them. Jesus didn't give up on us. He went to the cross. He went the full way. He endured the cross. He didn't quit in the Garden of Gethsemane. He hung on the cross for you and for me, and if he did that for us, we can do that for those around us. May God give us, listen, in this year, may God give us his heart. May God fill us with his love. May we see people as God sees people. May God guard us from religious uh, self-righteousness and having a critical attitude rooted in judgmentalism. May God search our heart and, and root out, weed out, the hatred we may have. Maybe you've been wronged and you've been justifying hatred in your life because of something that's been perpetuated against you. You need to let it go. It's a prison that you're making. It's a poison for your soul.
Tonight I want to encourage all of us, may the spirit of the living God fall afresh on our lives. May we be a new wineskin that God can say this, I can use that church. I can use that life. I can use those people. You know what? They are humble. They're submitted to me and I'm going to send them to people that I know need my love. Are you willing to do that this year? All right. Good. Good. Father, we love you, God. Thank you so much for your word. We're, we're thankful for the truth of the scripture and how you speak to our hearts and how you challenge us. And Father, I pray that you'd work these things deeply within us, not, God, not just in word only, not just that we would leave this place and, and affirm what we've heard with our mouth, but God, that there would be a, a work of your Holy Spirit deep within our lives. And that we would take the time to evaluate and to ponder and to let you search us, God, to root out, to weed out anything that may be displeasing to you. God, that we would be that new wineskin in which you pour out new wine. That we would be your vessels. That we'd not only be submitted, but God, that we'd be surrendered. That we would want what you want. That, Lord, we would love what you love. And so I pray this year, I pray for each of my brothers and sisters in this room listening online. God, grant them a year where they have not only the boldness and the courage to bring the message of the gospel, not only the trust and faith to believe that it's your message that's powerful to save, but I pray, God, that you'd grant them the privilege this year of leading somebody into the arms of Jesus, your son. Father, please, I pray, grant that gift to each of these here tonight as they make that their prayer to you. I pray, Father, that just as you heard from heaven at the repentance of the Ninevites, God, that you'd hear from heaven the prayer of your children as we align ourselves to your will. And God, help us to be willing to be inconvenienced. Help us to be willing to battle down fear in our life. Help us to be willing to be rejected but God, I pray you would help us to believe you for better things and to see the divine appointments as you bring them into our lives. Tonight, as our eyes are closed, as our heads are bowed, maybe tonight, maybe the need in your life is repentance. Maybe in a way you're like the Ninevite. You've never put your trust and faith in God. You've never believed God. You've never responded to his message, the message of the gospel, that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. Maybe you've never put your trust and faith in that message. Tonight is your night. Just as Jonah was divinely sent to Nineveh to share that message, for those people to hear, God has brought you here tonight. God has brought you here to listen to the message of the gospel, to hear how much he loves you. God's love, lo God's love knows no bounds. There's no limit. It's limitless. And he's able to reach you. You're not too far from him. You're not too far gone. You're not too deep into your sin that he can't pluck you out. Your sin is not so deep and dark that he cannot forgive it. You are not so far gone that he can't do something new in your life. No, in fact, this is the desire of his heart. Here tonight, right now, this is what God wants to do. Will you come to him? Will you do what the Ninevites did 2,700 years ago? Would, would you respond tonight? You say, Pastor, that just sounds so simple. Yeah, it is simple because this is the way God has designed it. He is waiting to hear your heart, a heart of repentance and faith. And when he hears that, he is going to respond. Tonight, God is speaking to your heart and you'd say, Pastor, that's me. I, I need to repent. I need to turn away from my sins. I need to 
turn my life to Jesus Christ. I want to believe in the good news, the gospel. I want to be born again. I want everlasting life. I want to trust in Him. I want a new beginning. I want to be cut loose from these things that have been destroying me and driving me down. I want to be cut loose from my discouragement and the cloud that's been hanging over my life. I want God's blessings tonight. If this is you, I want to pray for you right where you're sitting tonight. I'm going to ask you, would you raise your hand tonight? Just acknowledge tonight that this is you, that God's speaking to your heart, that you want to take this step of faith. Stretch your hand up high tonight. I want to pray for you that God would give you the strength and courage to turn your heart to him in repentance and to believe in Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless you. It's awesome. Thank you for raising your hands. God loves you guys so much. Praise God. Anybody else? I see your hand here in the back. It's awesome. Thank you for raising your hand. If there's anybody else here tonight, I, I know this is why God has brought you here. He loves you this much. I want you to just simply raise your hand this evening. God bless you over here. I see your hand in the front. Thank you for raising your hand. It's so good. God is speaking to you tonight. Just lift that hand up high. I want to see who you are. God's going to do great things in your life. You have nothing to fear when you entrust your life to him. Is there anybody else? One more moment. One more question tonight. Maybe you're a child of God and you know you're wayward. You've not been walking with God. And, and tonight you are neck deep in the things of this world and you need to turn your heart back to the Father. You're like Jonah was, man. You are on the run. You are on the run. I want to tell you tonight, you can't run from God. And He has been tracking you down. He is speaking to your heart tonight. Let me tell you why. Not because He wants to judge you. Not because He wants to ruin you. But because He loves you. You cannot escape the love of God. And so tonight, surrender. Stop running from Him. Stop running from your Heavenly Father. Turn your heart back to Him. Tonight, if this is you, I want you to raise your hand. You need to re recommit your life to Jesus Christ. If this is you, just stretch that hand up high tonight. I want to see who you are. I want to pray for you as well. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for these tonight. We pray, please God, that you'd just bless them. Bless them mightily, God, and give them the strength now to take this step of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, I'm going to ask you guys, please, no movement in the chapel tonight. This is, this is the most important part of our service. Decisions are being made for eternity tonight. For those of you who have raised your hands, I'm so thankful for what God is doing in your life. I want to lead you in a prayer tonight. It begins your relationship with God. It's a prayer of repentance. And repentance means exactly what we've said tonight, that you're going to Choose to see things God's way. The things you've been doing have been an offense to Him. Repentance means that you're acknowledging that and you're turning away from those sins in your life. You're laying them down. You're stopping them. You're going to take up faith tonight in this prayer. You're going to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ that God did love you so much. He sent His only Son. And Jesus, His Son, died on the cross for your sins. He rose again on the third day. This is the message of the gospel. This is the good news. And the greater news is this, when you believe, when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord, God hears from heaven and He saves you. He makes you His son or daughter. Tonight, if this is you, you raise your hand. I want to lead you in this prayer tonight. Jesus, when He called His disciples, He called all of them publicly. He said to Matthew, who was a tax collector, collecting taxes, he said to him publicly, come and follow me. The Bible says Matthew got up. He left his tax collecting table. He publicly identified himself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, for those of you, God's touching your heart. I want to lead you in this prayer. I'm going to ask you to come forward as well. It's not to embarrass you tonight. It's to give you the great privilege of identifying yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. God's going to bless you for taking this step of faith. Tony's going to lead us in a song of worship. For all of you who have raised your hands, I want you to stand up right now. Come on forward forward here to the front of the chapel. I want to lead you in this very simple prayer. So if you raise your hand tonight, stand up right now. Come on forward right here. Refuge for the poor, shelter from the storm. This is our God. He 
will wipe away your tears and return your wasted years. This is our God. So call upon His name. He is mighty to say, this is our God. If there's anybody else tonight before I lead these in prayer, if God is speaking to your heart, don't turn away from the voice of God tonight. He's given you an opportunity. The truth is, you don't know if you're going to have another opportunity. God has given you an opportunity right here and right now to get right with Him. And I want to encourage you, take this opportunity seriously. Tonight, if He's speaking to you, tonight, if you know you need to be untethered, you need to be unhooked from the things of this world, you want God in your life. You want to be His son, you want to be His daughter, you want everlasting life. Tonight is your night. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time for you to make this decision. And so if there's anybody else, I want to give you one more moment. I don't want you to leave this place not having received all that God has for you. And so if there's one more person tonight, if this is you, Tony's going to continue leading us for a moment. I just want you to stand up, come on forward to the front. I want to lead you in this prayer. Father to the orphan and heal to the broken, this is our God. He brings peace to my madness and comfort in my sadness, this is our God. So call upon His name, He is mighty to save. This is our God. All right, I'm going to lead you guys in prayer tonight. This prayer is to God. He's going to hear you tonight. As I lead you in this prayer, just make this your prayer to Him. And as you confess your sin, and as you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible says God is going to hear from heaven. He's going to do an amazing work in your life. Let's bow our heads together tonight. And I'd like all of you to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Dear God, tonight I give you my life. I confess I've sinned against you. I'm turning away from my sin. I'm turning to Jesus, your son. I believe that he died for me. I believe he rose on the third day. I believe that through him, you have forgiven me of my sin. You've made me your child. You've given me the gift of everlasting life. God, tonight, I give you my whole life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. May God bless you. May this be a year that God reaps a harvest of souls through your lives in Jesus' name. Amen.